Well, fear, a friend of mine once told me, is that dark room where we develop our negatives. <laughs> and I remember when I really experienced a, a sense of fear that was really uh, kind of a cosmic fear. It was, I was six years old, and I was in the Cub Scouts, and they, yes, it was the 1950s, they did hazing in the Cub Scouts for six-year-olds. And so they told us that we were going to get branded with a hot branding iron to get taken into the pack. And uh, they had a little um, campfire with a little light bulb in the middle of it, in the middle of the floor. But, you know, we were six, so we believed them. And um, as, as we were led out from the room, all the kids were yelling, it's going to burn, it's going to burn. I mean, truly, cosmic, existential fear. And when they, when they branded us, it was a, a, a rubber stamp that had uh, ink on it, had our pack number on it. And um, I, I, I don't approve of that, but I did learn something. I learned that the things that happen in life, you know, we, we hurt ourselves with our fears more than the events in life hurt us. And haven't you noticed that? I mean, what do they say? The cover-up's worse than the crime? And it's the fear that we bring, the anxiety we bring to bear in the face of a problem in life that actually creates more of a problem than the problem. And I know there's a lot of problems in the world today, but how many times do we rehearse in our minds what could happen, what might happen, what did happen, instead of trusting in the outcome and working as best we can to do what is ours to do and then letting the rest go. This is the, the serenity prayer, knowing what's ours to do and what's not ours to do. St. Francis wrote about it beautifully. He said, we just need to relax, do what we can do, enjoy the process, and allow God to do what God does. Just let it go. And trust that what's going to work out is going to work out for the highest good. Now you say, sometimes things don't work out to my liking. And that's a very tricky thing. Because if you're a soul in evolution, I am a soul in evolution together. I am a soul in evolution. And if that's true, then every circumstance in life can be used for your growth. And as you look around you, every circumstance in life can be used for the growth of the people around you. But you have to let go of the arrogance, which is a very tough word, but the arrogance that says that when things show up differently than what you had in mind, that somehow something's wrong here. Instead, you can work with what shows up as Jesus did. Remember, there were many times in his, uh, in his ministry where he was protected because he was guided, like they were told to go around the Samaritan lands because it was dangerous, and he told them that. So they were protected. You don't go down this street, you go down that street. There were other times when they came to seize him and he just disappeared. You know, it's like the quarterback that just, you know, was able to get away in the pocket. And, and I know it's a football analogy, okay? But it's that time of year. But, but that disappe he just disappeared. I mean, he, they couldn't hold him. But there were other times, remember the Garden of Gethsemane, where he, he was uh, taken hold of. And there's a time when to get to the highest good, you have to go through experiences that may look different than what you have in mind. I love what St. Pio, Padre Pio, wrote, and this is tough stuff, this is deep into the pool stuff. To be worried because something we have experienced has not turned out in accordance with our pure intention shows a lack of humility and is a clear sign that we have not entrusted the success of our action to the divine assistance, but have depended solely on our own strength. This is tricky because we, we say, well, what's ours to do and what's not ours to do? How do we let go and let God, how do we experience this sense of trust in the face of situations that turn up maybe differently than we have in mind? You know, one of the ways that we can experience that divine protection, that trust of God, is to let go into a space of I don't know, to let go into a space of trusting anticipation. And um, I, I love the story uh, in the Bible where, where one of the disciples asked Jesus, well, we got to pay our taxes. What should we do? And he said, you know, um, what you got to do is just take your line, put it over the side, and you're going to catch a fish. It turns out it's a tilapia fish. It's actually literally what it was. So just think about that next time you eat a tilapia. It's biblical. And, and you, when you pick it up, it will have a coin in its mouth. It'll be exactly the amount of money we need for two people's taxes, yours and mine. And that's exactly what happened. Now, sometimes when we go into that space of I don't know, when we ask the question and go into that intuitive, 
opening of wonder, creating that, that gap, that opening. Some wonderful things rush in. What does the universe abhor? A vacuum. And so it tolerates a Kirby. But it, 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 it abhors a vacuum. That's supposed to be a joke. Uh, it, 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 it abhors a vacuum, and, and you open up a space, and some, the answer flows into that space. And, but it takes that willingness to ask the question, to go into the I don't know, and to get the answer, which of course brings me to, once again, the question and answer process. Now, how many of you have ever used this process that I've shared on Sunday mornings? Raise your hand. Question and answer process, you ask a question, you go into a space of I don't know, and you take the answer that comes up. My mentor back 30 years ago, Dr. Mary Allen, was one of the founders of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy out in California, and she was in my congregation, and then when I moved to Florida, she worked with me for five years and really taught me these different methods. And one of the things she taught me was that you can get any answer that you need if you just go into a space of I don't know after asking. Not literally, necessarily. Not necessarily the kind of answer that you had in mind, but an answer that will move you in the direction that you need in order to fulfill your soul's evolution. Now, um, once very soon after she taught me this, I was involved, and I've shared a little about it in other Sundays, in a situation where there were some things happening under the table in the church that were really troubling. They had to do with finances and risk management and some really tough stuff that was going on. And I asked, what should I do about it? She was actually holding the space for me while I was doing this. And I went into this space of, I don't know. And what came up was the face of a guy. It was a guy who came to all the services. He came to all the classes. And he was a well-dressed gentleman. Uh, I didn't know him at all, but he seemed very intelligent. So I walked up to him. It was that time of year we were looking for board nominees. And I asked him, uh, what do you do for a living? And he said, I own a bank. We needed help with being able to clean up our financial situation. And furthermore, I, I was the financial controller of one of the largest cities in Florida. This guy was custom made to over the next three years, especially with the help of his friend who was a risk manager and gave his services for free, to work everything out in absolute order. Nobody even had any idea in the church except for the board that there was even anything that was going on. And we were able to work things out. Now, how did that happen? Why did that pop into my mind? Well, I think that one of the important things is that we've got to take time in letting go of worry, to let go of problems altogether and nurture our soul to keep our channel open. What are you doing on a daily basis to keep your channel open and to nurture your soul? How many of you have hammocks? Raise your hand. What? Hammocks. Hammocks. All right, how many of you have a chair that you have access to that you can go out to in a garden somewhere? Hammocks are cooler, but that's good enough. You can, you can sit and enjoy that. You can use crutches, aids like bicycle and rides and hikes and, and dealing with nature and allowing your soul to be nurtured. You can do things like taking the prayer for protection and experience that protective presence through using this affirmation and even using it as an affirmative prayer meditation. What do I mean by that? You take each line. You say it aloud, you say it quietly, you silently think it, and then you wait for your mind to wander, and it will, and you go to the next line. And you take that, and in that way, it moves the message of that protection into your deepest subconscious mind. So this is an interesting thing. You can move with something that we do at the end of every service, and move with it to, to experience that protection. You know, James Philip Freeman wrote the prayer for, for protection, and the reason why he wrote it was because during World War II, they needed a prayer when people wrote Silent Unity for people who were in the front lines and their loved ones in the war. And they were sending them the 23rd song, song and they got complaints. Letters of complaints saying that when they got to the line, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, they weren't too crazy about that. So, so they went to James Hill Freeman and they said, we need you to write something that would work better than that. And he said, let me get this straight. You're asking me to write something that improves on the 23rd Psalm written by King David. Well, I'll give it my best. And so he took an old affirmation of his and worked it around and he created this wonderful, wonderful affirmation. Let's say it together saying me, okay, together. The light of God surrounds me. The love of God enfolds me. 
The power of God protects me, and the presence of God watches over me. Wherever I am, God is. And all is well. And he didn't write that last line. But he told me he didn't mind if other people did it, although he, I had a feeling he kind of did. But, but, that, but it was actually, the, it stopped there. And the actual prayer was taken by James Irvin to uh, Irwin to, to the moon and left there on the moon. So it's up there still. And it was taken because he had received it when he was a child and he wanted that protecting presence. Another person, Norman Vincent Peale, wrote a wonderful article about this. He said, in my pocket as I write these words is a card I always carry with me and I've retyped it over and over again. And there are five lines as follows. The light of God surrounds me. The love of God enfolds me. The power of God protects me. The presence of God watches over me. Wherever I am, God is. Now, why do I carry this card around with me? Because it evokes an image of a loving, caring presence that is the perfect antidote to every fear, every worry, every anxiety, to just about every problem under the sun. Wherever I'm troubled, I take that card out and I let it remind me that there is an all-powerful being in this universe who loves me and is only a prayer away. This is the greatest concept that any human mind can hold. And what happens? You cannot keep worry and fear in the same consciousness as you keep that protective presence and trust. It just drives it out. And then what happens? Then things work out for the highest good. Sometimes an idea doesn't just pop into your head. Sometimes you don't just get a, a, a visionary experience, but things just kind of work out. You sometimes have to be patient, though, and keep working on your own anxiety becoming what is called a calm, non-anxious presence. I learned about this from Norman Vincent, not Norman Vincent Peale, from the other guy, uh, Robert Schuller. Robert Schuller uh, uh, invited a bunch of ministers to his big estate on Maui to bounce ideas off of them from his book that he was writing, and he gave them all a wonderful lunch, and a friend of mine said, why don't you just come along? I said, I wasn't invited. He said, oh, he won't mind. <laughs> well, he didn't say he minded, but anyway, I was sitting there listening to him, and he bounced off his ideas, he, he led us in different experiences, and then, towards the end, he took questions, and of course, he said, I'm a minister, I understand it's hard to be a minister. What kind of problems and questions can I work with you on? Of course, one of them raised their hand and talked about some people in the church and some difficulties they were having and how do you deal with that kind of a problem? And he looked at him and smiled and said, I outlast him. Outlast him? What do you mean outlast him? He said, I think of myself as the old moon up in the sky. And dogs may bark at it, and dogs may howl at it, but that old moon just keeps on shining. And I thought to myself, that is so powerful, especially since one of the difficult people that I had to deal with was at that very weekend. He was there sitting in the room. And afterwards, we were supposed to go on a kind of a nature walk and pray and meditate and stuff. So I got, he went this way, I went that way. And I sat down at the bench and I said, oh God, help me with these feelings that I feel about this guy. And I look up and he's walking right towards me. So I get up and I walk over to another bench and another trail. And I said, and I, oh God, help me with these feelings, whatever. And he's walking up to me again. So I finally surrender and I let it go. And he comes up to me and guess what? We talked it out. We worked it out. I, he didn't stop his behavior, but I was able to deal with it in a peaceful way. And it was a beautiful thing. It was a real heart-to-heart -heart talk. Now, sometimes being that non-anxious presence is all that it takes. That's having the serenity to accept the things you cannot change. And sometimes when you do that, you're freeing the energy up for things to work out out, out here. You know, I had a situation in my very first church where we had um, uh, two or three people who were in the office management position and, and this one person left. And, um, you know, I didn't know. I was so young. I, I had no idea. How do you hire somebody? What do you do? And so I just finally said, okay, God, thank you for the right, thank you for the divine solution to this perfect problem. So I'm going to ask you to say that with me together. Thank you for the divine solution for this perfect problem. 
And I just went into that. I didn't know the question and answer process, but I went into that space of just being open. And this woman's face popped into my mind again. And it was somebody who worked in Sunday school. We only had one service, so I didn't really know her. And so I went up to her. I said, hi, do you know anything about office management? And she said, well, three years ago, I retired as the main uh, office management um, supervisor for Los Angeles County. She had a thousand people under her and she could take dictation at, you know, a hundred and something words a minute. That was unbelievable. And she was, she, she said, I'll, I'll be happy to stay for six months and then you can find the right person. Well, I left four years later and she was still there and she was still there ten years later and she finally <laughs> retired. So I told Betsy at the first service, you know, let that be a lesson to you, you're not going anywhere. But, <laughs> but this was, I was open, I was open to an idea, I was open to an idea, but it meant I had to get my attention off the problem and onto, not the solution, because it's not the solution itself, it is being open to letting go of the problem and then letting the solution work out naturally according to divine grace. Now sometimes that means that we've got to stop running around on the hamster wheel. You know the hamster wheel? That's that part of the mind that wants to figure out everything and analyze it and come up with the answer. The analytical part of the mind has a place when you're balancing your checkbook or you're making your schedule or something, but there's a deeper part of you that, that, that presence that you were experiencing during the meditation that is, we call it the Christ in us, and it's that, that presence that has all the answers. Which brings me to what happened when I googled on the, the, on the, uh, the concordance uh, about Jesus and worry, and what came was this story. Martha had a sister called Mary who sat down at his feet and listened to his teaching. Martha was upset and worried over all the work she had to do, so she came and she said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself? Now you tell her to come and help me. Martha, Martha, Jesus answered, you are worried and so upset over so many things, but just one thing is really needed. Mary has chosen the best part, and it will never be taken away from her. Well now, what is this best part? Martha's just getting the work done. Have you ever heard somebody? I've heard people interpret this that, that Mary was irresponsible and Martha was doing the right thing and Mary should have just gotten up off her duff and, and helped. You ever heard that one? <laughs> when somebody, I heard, actually heard somebody say that once. But there's that, this story really is not about Martha, Mary, Jesus. It's about you and me. And that Martha is that part of me that wants to solve all the problems that goes around trying to figure everything out. And Mary is that problem that does what? Well, it, Mary's in touch, she says, with the one important thing, the only important thing. Now, let's have a little audience participation. What do you think that one important thing that Mary was in touch with was? Spirit. Being present with Jesus. Being present with Jesus. So, what does Jesus represent in you in this story, this metaphysical interpretation we're doing? He's that inner voice, that inner presence that is always there. Always there, but the Martha in us is doing what? Running around. Running around mentally, running around emotionally, and running around physically. But there's a part of us that can stop. That can stop and go to the hammock. Or stop and, and, and go and, and do the prayer for protection. And it's so strange. Getting your mind completely off the problem completely divorcing yourself from the thoughts of, of the worries or all that stuff and moving into that, that conscious presence, using that prayer for protection, doing the work that you do, will allow the natural answer to arise. And then you can let go of worry. Here's that famous quote from Jesus about worry. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself. Every day has got enough troubles for its own sake. And then he said, Aren't sparrows sold two for a quarter? Not one of them falls on the ground without God. And every hair on your head is accounted for. So don't be afraid. You're, you matter more than a whole heap of sparrows. And it's actually what he said, heap of sparrows. But you are more important. And like Mary, there, it means you've got to let go and work on your own anxiety. Your anxiety is what keeps the static going so that you don't receive the intuitive guidance. You say, you know, I don't see an answer here. I don't feel that there's an answer here. It's because the anxiety that you feel 
covers over the answer that is always there, always present. Ah, but sometimes, like Padre Pio said, you've got to let go of your idea of what that answer is. But if you will work on your own anxiety and then let it go and move into that space, move into that space. Sometimes, sometimes when you want protection, it looks like you're in danger. There's a technique that was shared when I was a teenager in the Youth of Unity by uh, Ernest Wilson, where he said if somebody seemed to be wanting harm to him, he would just visualize Jesus standing next to them with his hand on their shoulder. Well, I had an experience of that when I was working in the ambulance company in Oakland back uh, 40 years ago. And there was a guy who we picked up who had uh, been in some kind of a fight. And we were taking him, it was an emergency, so I had lights and sirens going, and his friend, with his bloody knife that was this long uh, in his hand, kind of came in and sat in the passenger seat, and he was obviously on something, because he stuck the bloody knife in my throat as I was driving. That's not, that's not good choices right there. The guy who's driving the vehicle, right? And so he was like yelling at me, and, you know, that if, I, if anything happens to his friend, etc., and, and I, just, I just visualized that presence of Jesus with his hand on his shoulders. And, and, I, and, and he seemed to calm down a little bit. I calmed down a little bit. And I just said, you know, I, we both want the same thing. We want your friend to get to the hospital. And this isn't going to make me drive any better. <laughs> so he finally, and he calmed down. And, he, and we were able to get his friend to the hospital. And when we got to the hospital, he realized he better run, so he did. But, but that, that was a, a divine protection that came as a result of that visualization. Sometimes we need these little trick solutions in order to remember that protecting presence, whether it's the prayer for protection, sometimes just visualizing light, sometimes saying, thank you, God, for the divine solution to this perfect problem together. Thank you, God, for the divine solution to this perfect problem. Sometimes going into that space of I don't know, visualizing that presence of Jesus. There's any number of ways of doing this, but going into a, a consciousness that shifts the gears so that you're no longer on the level of the problem, but you lift up into the level of the solution. And this is a very interesting, very interesting and very challenging stuff because sometimes we have real needs in our lives, but we have to know that there are resources within us available to each one of us that we can call on. And you know, I had more I was going to tell you, but right now I think we just need to go into that awareness once again. And I know you've been into that problem-solving garden, but there's there's something more. There's an additional gift for you in that garden. So I just want you to remember once again what it feels like to not have a trouble or care in the world. And know that in this now moment, as you have let go of whatever it is you brought in with you, there is perfect peace. Know that this garden, which you engage with, with all your inner senses, also is the garden of your heart. And in your heart, in divine love, is every answer that you may need. And letting go of any need for any outer experience, but just knowing that opening up the vacuum, the, the opening is sufficient. Just ask whatever question you have and go into a space of I don't know and just sit in the quiet. And the beauty of this is that this unrolls and unwinds and rolls out into our lives unfolding as we move into our worlds day by day. The answers flow. We'll be in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. Something will come to us. Someone might hand us a book. A thought may 
you just come and bid. Thank you, God, for the divine solution to this perfect problem. So it is. Now take a nice deep breath and let it out and move into this now moment unencumbered by any pieces of paper or thoughts in your mind. Just know in this now moment you're safe. Everything you need is provided. You're supported by a chair. There is air and the beneficial life-giving energy of God all around you. Once again, just take a nice breath in and let it out. And know that in this moment, in the safety and the security, and the sense of well-being of this moment, you can let go of all concerns and allow them to work out for your highest good. this moment, just imagine that there is an enclosed garden that you're going to enter. Notice what kind of enclosure. Is it a, a wall, a fence? What is it? It's the most beautiful garden and it has a gate or a door in the middle. And it says problem solving garden. sense the beautiful colors you hear the sounds of nature perhaps birds buzzing insects rustling leaves wind you can smell the scent of the garden there in the center of this garden with its vivid energized colors there's a chair or a bench this is where you are going to sit and let go and trust and so walk over to that chair for a moment and as your mind may wander just bring it back to the awareness of what what it looks like the sky above the beautiful foliage what it feels like the scent of the wind and the pressure of the air upon your skin the sounds the scent in the air engage all your inner senses. I am safe here. I am comfortable. I am at peace. And now just imagine that you're unwrapping your problem, however that looks to you. And you're letting it go up into the sky. You're letting it go and it's just floating up symbolizes your problems floating up into the sky. I release, I let go. I fully and freely lose this problem as it drifts up into the sky. All that has happened is complete. I free myself to my eyes foot into the guidance.
thank you that in this moment everything is provided. I am truly safe. In this now moment is all there is. And in my innermost heart, which is represented by this garden of the heart, this paradise in my heart, tell you a story. Uh, how many of you know uh, a writer named Mark Victor Hansen in a book called Chicken Soup for the Soul? Um, he co-wrote it with uh, Jack Canfield. And back in 1978, I drove him around. It was before he was even famous. Uh, he was speaking in the town. And he shared with me that he was going to be uh, successful in his life because he had two practices. One is he tithed, he used 10% of his income to his spiritual sources, and the second is that he saved 10% of his income. Well, I didn't see him for 10 years. He was a very engaging, wonderful guy, and he came to speak in the church that I was serving, and um, he had he shared with the group that uh, he had made over a million dollars and then lost it, but he knew he was going to bounce back because he had these two practices. He tithed and he also saved 10% of his income. And there was one woman there who said to me afterwards, yeah, right, uh-huh. Well, he had, he had just finished this book called Chicken Soup for the Soul with his uh, partner, Jack Canfield. And it's so interesting because Jack Canfield spoke at a friend of mine's church. This book wasn't going anywhere. It was in a little press, uh, Health Communications. Nobody was buying it. And he gave a workshop for a small group of people, no bigger than ours. And a woman was sitting there and the minister didn't even know this, who was the chief of education for the National Education Association, all the teachers in the country, the teachers union. And she bought 50,000 copies of the book and went to oh. number one in the New York Times <laughs> bestseller list. And the, the, rest, the rest is history. He just Ooh. stayed with his spiritual practices. So when you feel anxiety, sometimes the best thing to do is to do your spiritual practices quietly and trust in the outcome. So now we're going to take our offerings. And our offering statement is, I give in a spirit of faith and I receive abundantly. Together, I give in the spirit of faith and I receive abundantly. And silently. And again aloud together. I give in the spirit of faith and I receive abundantly. And so it is. Amen.